So we're going to be continuing on our series um, looking at Nehemiah 4 to 6. Uh, I think I messaged out just if you wanted to read that in advance because um, I'm not going to have the passages up on the screen. It's just too much uh, text to have up. So uh, have your Bibles open and uh, you can kind of see there's main themes that the chapters uh, take us through and we are actually going to work through chapter 4. We're going to mention chapter 5 and then we're going to look at chapter 6 and then our our response as a church to what God is doing with Nehemiah through this. And this week is really focused on um, distraction and opposition. I'm going to give you a chance to get up and leave now if you, <laughs> if you want, if it sounds too challenging a, a, a message for you. So I wanted to have our first slide up and I remind us of our vision, who we are as a church. We are a Jesus-centered family, both giving out and living out hope. That is the vision that when Neil and I were praying, who are we as a church, God, and where are you taking us? The wordsmith who is Mr. Thompson crafted this phrase and said, this is who we are. We are a Jesus-centered family. We, we, we center ourselves around his presence. We are a family. We live out hope and we give out hope. So that internal reflection and that external action of making sure that we are integrating into our communities for people around us. We are people focused on Jesus and on loving one another well. We are a beacon of hope for our area, uh, for our uh, church, for our work, for our lives, for our communities, but we are a beacon of hope. We had a, a great time at our prophetic course on Thursday night. We've quite a lot of people in the church are doing the prophetic course at the moment. And it's amazing. We're, I'm having a great time. I think other people are as well. And it's been encouraging, uplifting, uh, affirming, and amazing to see what God says over people in our church. And that's one of the things I love about the prophetic is I now have insight into how God views other people. And I get to see them the same way now. But on Thursday night, I was asked a question. We were, I don't know how we migrated into uh, the message on Sunday. And they said, well, Joe, what are we building in NBCF? And, uh, and I just said, well, we are building what God is doing. And so then the next question has to come, well, what is God doing in NBCF? I want you just to think for 10 seconds for yourself. What do you think God is doing in NBCF? So we want to always partner with what he is doing. And what he's doing is he's bringing young families to us. I know that there's not many here today, but he is bringing young families to us. He is moving his presence amongst us. The last series that Neil did with the presence of God, it was difficult to close worship sometimes because his presence was moving. I love that. That's my favorite time. He's building a prophetic culture. He's wakening people up to be hungry for his word to share his voice with other people. He is solidifying a strong community in NBCF, a people who love one another really well. And so we build around what he's doing. Neil and I don't have some agenda. We are simply saying, God, what are you doing? And we're going to partner with that. Remember, we felt we said God saying that he wanted to build a children and families worker. And so we said, we're going to build around that. Let's hire a children and families worker and look what he's done with that. So our response is twofold. Do what is in front of you. If there is a need in front of you, put your hand to it. As I said last week, they built the wall right in front of them. Do what is in front of you. And yes, I'm sorry, this might be as mundane as joining a rota but do what is in front of you. Ask God what he's building and where you fit in. Be listening. And I want to encourage all of you in what I said on Thursday night as well, was guys, listen to God. What is he saying? What do you hear God saying that he's doing in NBCF? God wants to tell us what he's doing and we want to partner with him. I want you to dream with God. God, what do you want to do in this community? God, what would it look like if we had a building? 
a permanent place to call home in NBCF, a place where the community could come and take refuge and be safe? What if we were able to be a healing presence in our communities, a place where people needed physical, spiritual, emotional healing, that they could come? a center of healing within our communities. And I think we have an opportunity to dream with God as he's building. And I wanna encourage you as a church, as we are working through this, ask God what he's doing, dream with God what he's doing, and then come and tell us, you know, come and talk to us about it. We wanna partner. Okay, let's look into our series, our chapters this week. The context of chapters four to six. Chapter four, the building of the wall is now well underway. We saw in chapter three that they worked shoulder to shoulder and now the wall is well underway. They're about at half height now. And uh, this is when opposition really kicks in. He's already been opposed, but opposition really kicks in now. And he starts receiving mockery and threats And so he stations people on the wall at the weak spots uh, to strengthen and to to protect those vulnerable gaps. Then we see in chapter five that he sees that there's wrongdoing being done. And you can read it for yourselves, but he sees wrongdoing that is happening with the people and he sets that right. He undoes the wrong and he redeems it. And he says, no, we're going to fix this and make sure this doesn't happen again. He showed integrity. Chapter six, we then have more opposition comes uh, to the building, but more so to Nehemiah, actually. Very personal opposition. Through chapter four to six, we see nine different tactics used to try to stop the work on the walls and to try and stop Nehemiah. We see ridicule, plots of war, discouragement, fear, selfishness, compromise, slander, threats, and intrigue. It's a lot, right? It's a lot for one guy, isn't it? But all the while, Nehemiah trusts deeply in the faithfulness and strength of God. If you do have time to read those chapters, take note that every time something happens, Nehemiah turns his face and the people's face to God and his strength. So let's look at chapter four. Nehemiah is being massively opposed, vehemently opposed. This man called Sanballat uh, is the guy that's opposing him. And he isn't just being unkind. He's not just being a little bit mean. He's being aggressive. He's ridiculing. He's bullying. He's really giving Nehemiah a super hard time. So there are things for us to learn when God is building. Now, I don't just mean that God's only building an NBCF. These are things for us to learn when God is building something in our lives, in our workplaces, in you as a person, in your families. Yes, in NBCF, in our communities. But when God is building something anywhere, there are things for us to learn. Okay. So if you're taking notes, I've got a few titles for you. Conflict is inevitable. Conflict is inevitable. So from the outside, they were being ridiculed with nasty and damaging words. But on the inside of the walls, they were beginning to feel demoralized and disheartened. Sanballat gathers his negative allies and starts increasing the bullying on them. He belittled them, and the word that they used was feeble. And that word feeble means withered and miserable. It's a bit mean, isn't it? He mocked their optimism. He undermined their confidence. He magnified their problems. He ridiculed and demeaned their efforts. He said things like, even a fox could break that wall. It's very playground, isn't it? Even a fox could break that wall. Like, what do you think you're building? A fox could stand on it and break it. Now, archaeologists, when they discovered the wall, found the remains to be nine feet thick. That's a pretty robust fox, isn't it? But how that little worm gets into their heads, oh, what we're building's not any good, it's weak, we should stop. They hoped that they would second guess themselves. The accusers hoped that the builders would second guess themselves. Now today, we would call Sanballat a troll, wouldn't we? Somebody who intentionally makes inflammatory, rude, upsetting comments, 
to elicit strong emotional responses in people, to steer conversation off topic. Sometimes these people do it for their own amusement, sometimes it's to push an agenda. Now, Sanballat was the latter, he had an agenda and he wanted to cause harm. And one of the things he did was he gathered his allies. Negativity attracts. And they gathered around disagreement. And this sort of behavior happens today, and sadly, not just from outside the church. So conflict is inevitable. Discouragement is understandable. It says in the passage, the strength of the laborers is giving out. Now they were toiling and stumbling under the work that they had. And it reminds us of Elijah. He was exhausted and he was under a great depression. You might remember this passage. And he he fled and he took some time aside. And an angel of the Lord came and tended to him and said, you need to nap and have a meal. And actually, sometimes the best thing that we can do when we're exhausted is have a meal and have a nap. He took time aside to eat and rest. And what the commentators were pointing to here is that we are never meant to push ourselves to the limit of our natural energies. These people were exhausted. And in that place of exhaustion, it is so much easier to feel discouraged. We are more likely to feel discouraged when we are exhausted. I know that in my own life. When I am run down, when I have not prioritized rest, when I'm not eating well, and something comes along, it topples me so much more easily. If we have the next quote up, John Bunyan says, the believer that is resolved for heaven, if Satan cannot win him by flatteries, will endeavor to weaken him by discouragement. Discouragement is easiest when we are exhausted. And so protect rest. Protect rest. God deliberately put a day of rest into his week. We are not designed to live without restorative relaxation. It is so important to have a scheduled, protected rest in your space, in your week. Control your schedule to to prioritize rest, especially if you are feeling discouraged, especially if you are in hardship and discouragement. Prioritize rest. It is the best thing you can do. Elijah was in a a season of intense depression. It was called his great depression. And what God said to him is that you need to eat well and you need to sleep. And that is what we need to do to protect ourselves from discouragement. So for me, this looks like having fun. I need to make sure I have fun in my week. I got to go wakeboarding with Jodie this week. My arms can't quite go up past here now because I'm a bit sore. But it was so much fun. But I know that for me, rest doesn't look like sitting binging Netflix. Rest looks like having fun. It looks like having something where I'm not responsible for it. I'm not planning for it. I'm having fun. And that gives me life. And that is important for my rest, for my well-being. And so I want to encourage you, what is important for your well-being? Because whenever we're building something, we've got to prioritize rest as well. And then break it down. Look at the, the, the thing bit by bit. I imagine if they looked at the whole wall, that's quite an overwhelming task. And so they looked at the section in front of them. So break, break it down and look at it bit by bit. Okay, my next point is prayer is crucial. Nehemiah prayed. When he was under attack, when he was under discouragement and opposition, he prayed. And there are some different ways that he prayed. He prayed urgently. His response was to get this issue in front of God ASAP. It was his biggest priority. I need to get this issue, God, in front of you. He prayed earnestly. He urgently. He prayed honestly. He didn't hold back. He wasn't uh, being careful of his word choice when he prayed. He prayed honestly. And God knew it all anyway. God knew how he was feeling. And so be real in prayer. It'll guide you to a more honest place. 
but be real when you're praying. If you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling upset, if you're feeling opposed, pray honestly. And with that, he prayed passionately. He had been attacked personally and his motives had been challenged. He was under a lot of stress. It is okay to be passionate in prayer. It is okay to be maybe slightly unhinged in prayer. The number of times I have prayed and I've ranted and I've gone, God, and Neil said, Joe, why don't you pray about it? And I go, Amen! (laughs) But God sees it. He sees it anyway. So just come to him as you are and be passionate, be realistic. Nehemiah wasn't asking for lightning to come down on his enemies. He was asking God to authenticate, 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 (laughs) authenticate the truth. He was asking God to authenticate the truth. And so be realistic when you're praying. And he prayed dependently. They knew that they depended on God to get this done with the time and resources that they had. So take your disappointments and oppositions before God. Pray honestly, pray urgently, passionately, realistically, and depend on him. The next point is unity is essential. We see in the midst of all of this tension and discouragement and opposition, Nehemiah gathered the people and he encouraged them of God's might and awesomeness. Nehemiah was a man who knew fear. He knew what it was to be overcome with terror. Look at where he lived before when he worked for the king of Persia. He wasn't just sailing through life. That would have been a pretty terrifying place to live, knowing that at any moment your fate was decided for you by a king who didn't like the look of your face that morning. And so he empathized with them in their experiences. And that meant he could lead them with compassion. The most important thing he did was he reminded them of God's strength and his might, God's testimony of faithfulness. He shared plans uh, to continue on despite the threat. And so he said, I know that we have come under attack. I know that you're discouraged. I've been there. I understand. Lift your eyes up to God. But we also have a plan. Half of you are going to work and half of you are going to be armed. And he had a plan and he led them. For me, one of the most important parts of this passage was verses 13 to 14. And if we have them up. Nehemiah says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, not like American awesome, but like awesome. He is awesome, God. And fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I love this. They are in the midst of attack. And he says, we have a plan. I'm going to take your family, your family, and your family. And we have weak spots. And we're going to put you in the weak spots of the wall. And you're going to be armed. But guys, God is great. And he is awesome. And he is there for us. Do not forget him, but fight Fight for what matters. Now, we all have vulnerabilities in our lives. I have vulnerabilities in my life. And when something is being built, they can become exposed. So I want to encourage you, put people in the gaps of your life. Where you have gaps in your life, Put people who are of faith, who you trust, who you feel safe with, who you will take feedback from. Put people in the spaces of your life where you have weakness. Trusted people who will stand watch over you, who love you and will help you rebuild that area of your life. We all have areas of struggle, okay? There is not a single person who doesn't have an area of struggle, of sin, of insecurity. But find people who you trust. 
Invite them in and ask them to guard that part of the wall and help you to rebuild that part of your life. That is true community. True community, being vulnerable with the people who you're walking next to and saying, can I invite you to come and guard a place of my wall, a place of my life that I am weak in? Can I invite you in to remind me in that space that God is great and awesome, that you will come and you will guard that part of my life and help me rebuild that back into holiness, back into purity. And that takes bravery. That is hard. But that, that is true community. I love having a meal. I love having dinner with people. I love the fun stuff. But the fun stuff needs to lead to true community. And that is true community, real, authentic, living together, being open, being able to receive feedback, being able to trust, being able to be real. I'm a little bit passionate about that. The next point is sacrifice is inescapable. They worked hard. They worked hard on this wall. They rebuilt it in 52 days. 52 days. It should have taken years. They got up at dawn, they skipped siesta, and they worked till dark. They slept in their clothes in case of an attack at nightfall. And when something is being built, hard work goes hand in hand with that. Hard work is never free. It always costs something. Community costs something. Building something for the kingdom costs something. Being authentic costs something. It might cost time, it might cost effort, it might cost money, it might cost part of yourself, it might cost your free time, but it costs something. The cost might be great, but the reward is even greater. The next point is God is invincible. Nehemiah renewed their confidence in God. He reminded them of who their God was. That he was unique, that he was attentive to them, that he was righteous, that he was powerful, that he was holy, that he was sovereign, and that he is unfailing. He was gonna fight for them. And we, when we're building, or when we feel discouraged, or when we feel opposed, need to remind ourselves of our great and awesome God. Nehemiah assured them, God will fight for us. And though their exertion was necessary, their dependence on God was rewarded. God will fight for us. They didn't need to take matters into their own hands and take revenge at their opposition. They didn't need to do tit for tat. God will fight for us. So that's chapter four. Chapter five, there was economic and social problems which Nehemiah handled firmly, swiftly, but with compassion. And we're not going to focus on this chapter this week. I mean, do read it. It's, it's a brilliant chapter. And it showed Nehemiah to be a man of integrity and justice, that he fixed the wrongs. He had his own crisis going on. He was being attacked from all sides. And even when he was being attacked, he fixed the justice of other people. What a guy. Chapter six, for it doesn't get any easier for Nehemiah here. He's having a hard time. Raymond Brown says this, if we have the next post up. Nehemiah hasn't seen the last of his opponents. He has coped magnificently with varied problems, personal, political, administrative, and social. Now his united team has rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. All that remains is to set the doors in its gates. And this is coming into chapter six now. But soon he is confronted with fresh troubles. They are part of the enemy's design to shatter him as he puts the final touches to a highly successful operation. The memoirs now record details of distinct plots made against God's servants, servant at a crucial time in the enterprise. So that's where we're at when we're coming into chapter six. They're just about to put the doors on and more opposition comes. So there was a plot to kidnap Nehemiah. 
His opposers, Sanballat and crew, realized that they couldn't bring the job down. So they tried to bring down the man. They knew that it was more than a wall that he was building. He, they saw that he was building a community, a community with faith, a community with a great and awesome God. And they knew that he was a great influential spiritual leader. So Sanballat and his ally Geshem wanted to lure Nehemiah into the valley of Ono. I mean, it's in the name, isn't it? Oh no, better not go down to Ono. Oh the thing is, it would have taken a day's travel to get there. You would have had a day of negotiations and a day's travel back. And Nehemiah knew that he couldn't afford three days out of the, the important work that he was doing. And he also knew that they were planning to harm him. So he replied and he said, I am carrying on a great project. I cannot go down to you. Why should I stop work and leave it to go down to you? Four times that message was sent. Four times the same reply was given. But Nehemiah knew his conviction and he was standing by it completely unmoved. He refused to be manipulated. He refused to be distracted by them and their plans because he knew what God had called him to do. The next plot was much more devious. It was a plot to malign him. So you can read that there was a, an unsealed letter that was being brought by a messenger. And this is a malicious move. There was a, a messenger that was being brought to the city and in it was an unsealed letter. Anyone encountering this messenger would have been allowed to read the letter. And I imagine probably encouraged to, to read the letter. And this is the fastest way to spread untruth and instability, is to plant seeds of speculation. This is gossip at its absolute finest here. The message in the, the letter, in the scroll, accused Nehemiah of dishonorable intentions and corrupt motives. It accused him of wanting to become king himself. And they knew that as gossip spreads, word travels back. And they knew that if word got back to the king of Persia, it would have resulted in Nehemiah's immediate recall and pot potential fatal outcome. So being an honorable man, this would have been horrendous. I mean, horrendous for anybody, but a man of such integrity, a man of such honor, this would have been a very upsetting moment for him. But he handled it by setting the record straight, but he also didn't get lured into it. He said, that is not true. He just said, that is not true. That is not what is happening here. And that was it. He didn't get lured in. We don't want to let other people's negativities, opinions or gossip take all our focus or our time. Martin Luther King, if we have the next slide up, says, said this, seldom if ever do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day and would have no time for constructive work. <laughs> yes, unjust accusations are hard to handle. They are difficult to hear when people make unjust accusations about you, about your character, not just about what you're building, but it's hard. It's hard to hear those things, but there's things that we can do in those moments. We want to examine ourselves. Is there any truth in it? Take it before God. Is there any truth in that? Go to the people standing in your walls, your safe people. Is there any truth in that? Examine scripture. It gives us guidance, guidance on how to respond to people who want to harm us. And examine God. We always see a different side of the Father. His care and protection over us in hardship which we don't see in times of plenty and times of ease. And I know in my own life, when accusations have come my way, I have known the affirmation and security of the Father louder in those moments than I have when life is sailing nicely. These are also times to build intimacy with God as I seek his truth. And so there's things that we can do whenever accusations and opposition come our way. 
And Nehemiah then said, he dealt with it, and he then said, now God, strengthen my hands. He knew that God was his refuge and his strength in midst of awful maligning. So how do we handle it when people try to malign us? We set the record straight. We don't get lured in. We ask God to check our hearts. We realign ourselves to the Father and hear his truth over us. And if needed, take safe and wise counsel from people who are standing in the walls of your life. And the final plot was a plot to intimidate him. The plots worsen with each attempt. You think it's bad enough, don't you? You think, geez, Nehemiah, you've had a gig, haven't you? This is hard, and it gets worse. So now they're trying to defame his character. They've tried to kill him. They've tried to spread gossip about him, and now they try to defame his character. He's already shown himself as a man of integrity, of justice, and he had a friend who was a prophet, The prophet was an old friend of Nehemiah and he went to him, but he didn't realize that this old friend was now a new enemy because he had been bribed. He'd been paid by Nehemiah's enemies to ensnare Nehemiah. Oh, the plot thickens. And so he tries to sell this idea to Nehemiah that, come, we cannot stay in my house. It is not safe. We should go to the temple and we should lock ourselves in the inner room of the temple where nobody will be able to find us. This might sound quite plausible coming from somebody who you trust. They're trying to keep me safe. But Nehemiah was a man of wisdom and he knew that this was a plot to malign his character because he knew that he was not a priest and he was not allowed to be in the temple. And he knew that if the door was shut in a secret place, that any lie could be made about him, about what he did in that place. Any accusation could be made about him in a place that he should not have even been because he was not a priest. He was not allowed to be there. His wisdom prevailed and he saw through the plan and he responded, not by seeking revenge. How easy would it be for Nehemiah to just seek revenge on all of them? But he didn't. He prayed. God saw what was happening and was going to deal with it. He was going to deal with the situation and Nehemiah knew that. He had wisdom to see through the situation, but then wisdom to focus his eyes back on the Father. If we have the next quote up, Raymond Brown says, the great lesson is that the Lord is sufficient. Throughout this section of the memoirs, one adversity has followed hard on the heels of another. When sorrow comes, they come not single spies, but in battalions. And life is like that. And Nehemiah's stories has been preserved in scripture to demonstrate how we too, faced with multiple testing, can handle such pressures creatively. He has, a, he has an inspiration, isn't he? He has an inspiration. Hardship hand, taken hard on the heels of one another and his response is never to take revenge, but it is to turn his face and the face of the community back to the Father. And when God is building something in NBCF, in your own lives, in your families, there will always be some form of negativity, some form of criticism, disappointment. And we can't live hiding in a bush, can we? We can't live life hiding in a bush, trying to hide from anything that might harm us. Making a difference for God means having a voice. It means making a difference. It might mean upsetting people. But how we handle opposition is vital. Not that we can avoid it. We can't avoid opposition. But we can learn to be people who handle opposition. Bring God into the center. Bring him into the center of whatever he is building, in NBCF, in your homes and your families. Be real with him. Pray about it earnestly, passionately, urgently, honestly. Be real. Remind yourself and the people around you of his strength, of God's strength, of his great and awesomeness. Remind yourself of the testimony of what God has done before. Don't give your opposers any more time than they need to set this record straight. He didn't go down to the valley. He set the record straight and he went back to what God was building. 
and have people who you trust in your life. I don't just mean in your life who you walk to school with. I mean in your life, who know the inner workings of your life. Nehemiah had his close, trusted colleagues. You know, they were the people who he looked at the walls with. He was the people who he confided with. It wasn't the many, it was the few. Bring people into the gaps of your life. This is true community. We will always get through times of opposition and disappointment by keeping God in front of us and people who we trust beside us. If we have the last slide up, Raymond Brown says, with such confidence and commitment, Nehemiah and his colleagues continued to build despite verbal assault, psychological pressure, physical danger, natural discouragement, crippling fear and extreme danger. They were enabled to continue, not because they glorified in a robust faith, but because they trusted in a reliable God. That's a good word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are a reliable God and no matter the disappointment or opposition that we face in all aspects of life, that we can trust you, that you come and you strengthen our hands. And so God, I pray that you would help us to be a true community who invite one another into the walls of our lives to stand strong as we build what you are building, God, to be real and honest, to pray earnestly before you and to be partners with what you are building. God, help us to be people who keep Keep you in front of us and people who we trust beside us. Amen.